السلام عليكم once again بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, طيب إن شاء الله يعني we need to uh, to speak about how to recover from porn addiction but I wanted to make some disclaimers so number one it is always best to seek professional help if you are really struggling with porn consumption because sometimes the tips that we give like I have written a book here and I advise you, inshallah, I'm not trying to make a sale or anything, but, but this book called Beat It, 50 Plus Shades of Hope. I have written this book with the intention of making it accessible to those who cannot afford counselors' fees and, you know, uh, maybe therapists' fee if you are really struggling with, uh, with this addiction. So this is written in a very conversational manner so that you can interact with the book and pick tips and tricks to apply in your life on the hope of recovering from porn addiction. It, it includes over a hundred tips because what, what may apply or what may work for you may not work with another addict. Why? Because as counselors, we need to know the root cause that had led to your addiction. We have so many people in the community, in the society, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, who became addicted to pornography or and or sexual uh, undesirable sexual activities or even sexual dysfunction uh, for various reasons, for different different reasons. Some of them were molested when they when they were young. Some were literally raped. Some they have seen their uh, role models on porn, and as a result, they became interested and curious about it. So, for every reason, there is a a, a way to treat those people who are. Uh, tired uh, and sick of this of this addiction. So unless we deal with the root cause, it's going to be very difficult to deal with the addiction itself. So those traumatic experiences, if they are not dealt with, if they are not addressed, then treating the addiction itself become very, very difficult. So a counselor would need to know a bit of history about what led you to where you are today in order for that counselor or that coach or that professional to give you the appropriate program. We have tested in our, uh, in, in our academy a program that worked very, very well in the past two years. It's called the Critical Alignment Model, CAM, a recovery program, where we, uh, we, we lead those who are addicted to pornography into four stages uh, to, to uh, basically to fix and to align with the principles and values. And that is environment, structure and system, implementation, the art of implementation to the point of consistency, how can we do that? And involving people. And I will start with that, inshallah. I will start with the last point in mind, and that is involving people in your problem. Um, all, almost all the books that I've written, uh, uh, sorry, all the books that I've read and all the supervisors that I have interacted with and, and all the scholars that we have talked to about porn addiction solutions, they never miss out that point. And that is involving people in your problem. You will never be able, and this is, this is something like I believe wholeheartedly, you will never be able to break free from the cycle of porn addiction on your own, period. It's so, comp so compulsive and so addictive to the point that a person, an individual on his or her own will never be able to cope with those hormones and those rush. And you've been already uh, into this for many years and those who relate to it would know what I'm talking about. So the best option is to reach out to someone that you trust and highlight this uh, word trust because you don't want to go to someone and then that person would expose your sin. And I wanted to pause here for a second to also um, highlight the difference between exposing one's sins, which is abhorred and uh, or boasting, uh, rather, boasting about your sins proudly, saying that I'm doing this, I'm doing that, billah. so there is a difference between boasting about your sins, which is haram in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ talked about it, and reaching out to people and telling them about your sin with the intention of seeking help. And that is highly encouraged. And, and people will go to the Prophet ﷺ and tell them that this is our problem. And we mentioned the zina uh, example before so people wouldn't feel ashamed to go to the prophet sallam, or to go to other companions and confess their sins not to boast about it not to act proudly in front of the community that they are the guys and so on but rather to seek help and see how they can navigate around these tensions and these problems 
So it is absolutely okay for a person to reach out a counselor, an imam, an educator in the community, or a brother, a sister, a biological brother or a sister, or a spouse, a husband. And um, I, will, I will discourage wives to go to their husbands and confess this for a minute. I will explain why. But you have to have someone in your midst who know about your uh, addiction so that that person can hold you accountable. Where do you use your cell phones and devices? Why are you still up until uh, 9 p.m. and so on and so forth? So, so we call that person an accountability partner. It is highly encouraged for husbands to go and talk to their wives and bear with patience with the reactions as we mentioned earlier, but it is not encouraged for wives to do the same for various reasons. Men, they uh, react to this in a different way. They can act aggressively they can also become very jealous and things could uh, turn around and divorce could be the, the, the fate. Uh, it can create a lot of unnecessary doubts and so on. So it's always better for, and wives, subhanAllah, they have that heart and compassion to uh, help their husbands, but uh, unfortunately men don't have that uh, peace yet. So Allah make it easy and not all men the same, but generally speaking, the impact, and, and by experience, I'm sharing with you this, by experience, those uh, wives who shared their agony of porn addiction with their husbands, they have actually not been received uh, with that eye of mercy and compassion. It was really a dramatic experience in most of the cases that I've dealt with. So a sister could reach out to another sister in the community, uh, a respected educator, um, a best friend who she know that she will not expose her sin out or or publicize it to anyone, rather she will uh, be there for her and support her on all levels, or a professional counselor. So this is something very, very important to bear in mind that an addiction of that sort will never be erased on its own. Uh, you have to have someone uh, with you as an accountability partner. Also, I wanted to mention something, spiritual solution on its own also is not gonna work. So this is something very, very important. And that, that doesn't mean that we are belittling of spiritual solutions. We have the ultimate guide, of course, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, the ultimate guide of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sunnah and his uh, ways to, to, to educate the Ummah. That's absolutely uh, essential for believers. However, uh, it, we should approach this issue from a multiple uh, models that are available in order for us to really cope with its compulsion. So uh, spiritual solutions is there, salah, dua, your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fasting and all these acts of ibadah. But at the same time, practical tips like, you know, uh, technology. You cannot make dua, Ya Allah, please help me to get rid of my addiction. Why you are spending most of your time on the internet browsing through the pictures of sisters online or going through the profiles of, of people on Instagram and this and that. No, you have to practically put some softwares to block all these uh, channels, especially nudity. And there are a lot of you know softwares nowadays. The, uh, Q Studio is one of them. Um, there is Family Zone, it's perfect, brilliant uh, Wi-Fi modem that can block nudity from your homes. You have to reach out to these solutions and do the necessary aqilha wa tawakkal, meaning you tie your camel and then rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as per the narration of the Prophet ﷺ, where a man came and he left the camel because he wanted to rush for the salah. But he didn't tie his camel. Why? Because he applied tawakkul or reliance on Allah that Allah is going to protect him. He said, no, take the necessary measure. You tie your camel first and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If something harmful befall you after that, then at least you have done your part. Similarly, make the dua, do the salah, reach out to scholars, ask them, you know, read about the harmful impact of pornography, raise awareness, do all these things, no problem. At the same time, apply a system in your life to also add further protection, like softwares to block nudity, like never use devices, internet devices in, in, in private places, behind closed doors, in your bedrooms, never do these things. Uh, always allow your family members to get in control of these devices after certain hours of the night or of the day, based on your experience on when do you usually relapse, never be alone. Like I always tell people who are, uh, always isolate themselves. 
with any excuse, no matter what excuse you have, if you want to get rid of your porn addiction, never stay alone. Minimize the time of being alone. Because you know, you know, يعني, uh, Omar ibn Khattab, anhu, arda, he said that uh, shaitan is with the individual and he's farther away from the two. So imagine if you enlarge the circle of the people around you, shaitan will be even farther away from you. So being alone is the beginning. That's, I, I think, in my opinion, number one trigger, number one trigger, not, not the imagery, not the porn uh, pictures and, and nudity and all the No, no, no. Number one trigger that brings people always back to their uh, 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 addictive cycle is being alone. You know it, I know it, we all know it. Once you are alone, shaitan is not there to accompany you on a journey of faithful, you know, uh, uh, up, uplifting. Shaitan is there to tell you what to do, to fill up your schedule, to tell you what sort of haram you can do. And since you have already been tested with this pandemic, pornography, you've been tested positive, you're addicted, shaitan already had a, a, a channel to use. And these are the thoughts that he will bring into your mind. And these are the flashback that you will see when you're alone. And once you're bored, you're alone, nobody's watching you. Unfortunately, we don't uh, think at that, at that com compulsive moment of addiction, we don't think that Allah is watching us and his angels are watching us. We don't think of that, unfortunately. They conceal their sins from people, but they don't conceal the sins from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while he is with them. Allahu Akbar. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, because the addiction overrides a person's behavior, they are clouded, they are blinded completely. But if your father is just next to you, or if your wife is just in the room, will you dare? Will you dare? Even if the addiction had intensified in your brain, even if the dopamine had reached to its spike, the only way you would relapse is leaving the room locking your door in another uh, you know, bedroom or anywhere else to indulge in your activities. So being alone is number one, uh, in my opinion, trigger that always bring people to the addictive uh, cycle. Uh, another tip, very, very important, uh, is productivity. I always say the two Ps never meet, never meet. The, the two Ps never meet, pornography, and, productive, and productivity. When you are on pornography, you are never productive. You will never achieve what you want to achieve. You will always set yourself to failure if you are on porn. And this is absolutely uh, tested and absolutely experienced by so many people that I'm dealing with. Students, people, I, I know people who have lost their job because of pornography. Wallahi, my brothers, I have written in my book, Aware, Aware, find out who you are without porn. In, uh, in, in one of the chapters, it's called Career Without Porn. And I'm relating a true story of a man who was promoted to leave from one country to another to work and to establish the same company in a different place. And he succeeded within two, three months and then the addiction hits and then he neglected his job. And even the boss came from the uh, headquarter to visit the new establishment the, the man couldn't even wake up in the morning to receive his boss who's coming from a different country uh, to, to welcome him into the new company because he was all night on pornography. As a result, he was fired and he lost his job. So I, I wrote actually that book and in every chapter I'm discussing how pornography could impact a different segment of society, children, teenagers, relationships, sexual relationships. Uh, career, jobs, mental health, physical health, men, women, faith. And the list could go on and on. I, I'm thinking to actually write another uh, part of this uh, book to, to, to emphasize on the importance of raising awareness about the harmful impact, uh, impact of pornography. So if you are on porn, you are never productive. You are setting yourself for failure. For failure. But once you're productive, pornography will cease to exist. Believe me, my brothers and sisters. Um, I remember when uh, when I was compiling these books, I've written four books basically on on, on self motivation. Uh, like I wrote this book called Change, uh, you know, uh, a motivational book to break free from undesirable habits, especially pornography. I wrote also a book called A Better Me, uh, 
365 ways to transform your everyday life. Believe me, the three books, those three books were written in two, three years. This book was written in three months because this book I have learned through this, uh, during this stage to be productive, to, to seize every minute that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us in our life. Uh, this book has been written every day for one hour after Fajr for three months. Now imagine if this one hour was, you know, misused by being on pornography. How would you ever be able to produce something well researched, alhamdulillah, uh, based on experience uh, and based on, on the work of uh, previous, uh, you know, scholars in the field and so on, productivity, Productivity, productivity kills pornography. The two Ps never meet. Remember this. So make yourself busy. Get out of the house. Um, you know, join the gym, <laughs> gymnasium, and go there because many people they will apply for going to the gym and uh, uh, but but they will just have the membership card and they, they never go there because they experience few, you know muscle pain the first few days and then they give up. Go there if you don't like going to the gym. Go and walk in any of the near buy parks if you don't like walking go swim and by the way exercise exercise is one of the medicines that can actually help you recover from porn addiction why because exercise produces the same hormones in the brain that you experience when you watch pornography so it's like a replacement or a substitute to uh, pornography. Now, many people don't like exercises and so on and so forth. Try to do some physical activities. Any physical activities would do. Just you need to move, you need to sweat, you need to bring those hormones out if you want to battle pornography. Um, what else we can do? Uh, set for yourself a standard of living. We have the best way of life is the life of Islam. Uh, that's why the word deen is used as opposed to the word religion because religion means set of rituals but deen is a way of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only teaching us uh, through the Quran and through the life of the Prophet sallam, to pray and fast and, and perform those ritualistic acts of worship no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also through the Prophet Muhammad sallam, is teaching us how to behave in almost every aspect of our life that's that's the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the way of life that allah had chosen this day i have perfected your religion for you completed my favor upon you and chosen for you islam to be your way of life can you imagine can you imagine if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had perfected this way of life why do we desire something other than that I always say, imagine if the Prophet Sallallahu is with us today and he decided to come and have uh, a rest in your home. Will he really set his foot in your house if he realized that your, 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 your home is full of Netflix movies and full of CDs of music and uh, MTV songs and YouTube inappropriate shows and, and Hollywood and Bollywood and whatnot, will, will the Prophet ﷺ, the noble Prophet ﷺ, set his foot in your home? Will he feel comfortable there? So we have to start really quickly to set the standard of our life and put structure in place, put boundaries in place, places to go to, places never to go to, people to hang out with, people to cut ties with, you have, to, you have to really filter your environment and put a structure in place. I remember I went to one of my mashayikh, I was telling some of my clients, I always tell them this story. Allah, my brothers and sisters in Islam, I never experienced something like that in my life. You know, when you invite someone home for dinner, you're expecting the table to be full of food and, you know, eat, just eat, whatever you want. We're going to serve you like, you know, we're going to just feed you. But this man, subhanAllah, a true scholar, he's not just inviting you to eat, but he's inviting you to learn. And subhanAllah, we went there and we couldn't see any food on the dining table. We were sitting on the dining, in the dining room. There was no food on the table. And we became hungry after one hour. You know, we were happy to meet the sheikh, but we were very hungry. So we told him, sheikh, we, when are we going to eat? He said, all right, let's come. Let's go. Let's go. So we went to the kitchen. And again, there was no food in the kitchen. <laughs> So he opened the fridge and before that he gave us plastic plates and forks and 
We were like, what in the world is going on? And he opened the fridge and we saw all types of food there. Now we are Egyptian, we were you know, Egyptian, so we don't eat heavy dinner. So it was like cheese, olives, eggs, and stuff like that, but full, mashallah, the fridge was full. And he started asking us the weirdest questions any host would ask his guest. He, he had a knife in his uh, hand. He said, Akhuya uh, Wael, he would call me like my brother Wael, um, how many pieces of, of this type of cheese would you like to eat? So I was like, oh my God, my sheikh is stingy. That's what came into my mind. So I start saying, okay, three pieces. So he cut three pieces. How many eggs do you want? How many olives do you want? How many pieces of pastrami do you want? How many bread do you want? And then I got already my, my share. And then he asked me, do you need more? I said, no, I'm right. I'm okay. And then everyone else, like, you know, he lined us up. Everyone else, he would ask him the same question. We were winking and we were whispering and we were backbiting him and we were mocking him. All these things happened. And then we went to the dining table. We ate, we enjoyed the food. Some people required, requested for more. He repeated the same thing. And then we finished. Many years later, I met him in Hong Kong City. May Allah bless him, Ya Rab. And I told him, Sheikh, you remember this day, this, this happened and this happened. I grew up in Egypt and my father used to say, the fridge is belong to anyone. No permission is needed if you wanted to eat anything. Grab what you like. You know, that's, that's how I grew up. My father is generous. And, and, and generosity is demonstrated through giving food, you know, feeding people. And subhanAllah, he said, that's your rules. That's, that's your home. That's your father. But in my house, I have a different policy. I have a different system. So can you elaborate, Sheikh? I said, like, this I felt very, very weird. He said, I have a policy. Whatever goes on the plate must go into your stomach. No one is allowed to return food in this house. So I'm asking you how much you can bear, how much you can eat, so that no leftover would be trashed. That's his system. Now call it weird, call it this, that, but that's his system that he applied it on others. If you want to get rid of your porn addiction, you have to apply a strict system, strict policy to yourself that would be imposed on anyone else. People in your presence would care about your policies. Like if, if people came to my house, I have a policy, no cell phones are to be used. You have to drop it in the basket. On the way out, you can get your cell phones and go home. Yeah? So subhanAllah, Azim, these kind of, of policies and structures in place would add extra protection to the spiritual solutions. And then we have uh, uh, implementation, how to implement uh, your 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 system and 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 keep your environment uh, forever inshallah until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day your children your money your wealth will never benefit you except those who came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day with a pure uh, heart and a sound heart may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them inshallah ta'ala implementation is the key. They said, uh, Imam Al Ghazali, I, I believe he said, Al ilmu bila amalin junoon, wal amalu bila ilmin la yakun. Knowledge without action is madness. You, you know what you're supposed to do, but you can't, or you're unable, or you don't want to, then you're crazy, you're mad, you're insane. Wal amalu bila ilmin la yakun. An action based on no knowledge doesn't really exist, it's void. It leads you to destruction. Like when I when I tried to drive a car without actually prior knowledge of driving, I I crashed into a tree because I didn't know how to stop the car. So I took an action, but I didn't know the knowledge. You see, so knowledge and action goes hand in hand. So the best way to apply knowledge is to have a bigger vision in your life. Why you're doing what you're doing? Why you're actually quitting pornography? Why you have decided to quit pornography? Why are you going out of your way and facing the uncomfortable situation of revealing your secrets to someone? Uh, wh why? What, what is the bigger vision, the bigger picture? And that is, subhanAllah, sometimes it's family. I have a client who told me I'm quitting pornography because I don't want my daughter to fall into the same sin. Because I have seen that a lot. I have seen a lot of parents coming, crying, regretting what they have done, what they have done for years, regretting not telling somebody else, like a counselor, like a coach. And they waited until a disaster had already happened. The man told me, I cannot lift my eyes and look at my daughter anymore. I cannot. And by the way, they got divorced. Like this family, well, the mother refused him. 
refused me. She said, no, no way. No way he's going to see my daughter. No way. So if you don't have a bigger vision, if, if you're running only after your desires and you don't care about others uh, you know, in, your, in your life, you, you will remain there all the time. Second point, and quickly, inshallah, before we uh, end the session, but second point is very, very important, is to learn to bear the pain that is associated with success. If you wanted to achieve anything, you have to go through certain pain and uncomfort and uh, situations and, uh, and time spent and studying and reading. If you're, if you're you know, a school student, you have to learn how to bear the pain. I talked to one of my professors who wrote 20 books, best-selling books. He, he was teaching us courses on uh, comparative religion, and he's quite popular. His name is Bart Ehrman. I asked him about his secret of producing such well-researched book, books every year, like every year a book would be launched. How, how does he get the time? He said, less entertainment. I don't have entertainment in my life. I have less. He didn't say, I don't, I don't entertain myself. He said, I just lessen the time of just chilling. So he had seven days a year, he go to some islands with his family and spend those seven days. That's it. The rest of the year, hard work, research, reading, educating. And as a result, he's looked at as one of the most important scholars of early Christianity in today's world. So if you want to achieve anything, you have to bear the pain that is associated with it. Discipline, discipline and consistency, discipline and consistency. And remember, you will never be able to maintain consistency if you are alone. If you are alone in this journey, you will never be able to maintain consistency. So once the plan is set, once the system is in place, once the environment is cleansed, somebody else must know all of the above so that they can always remind you to do what is necessary. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleanse us all from any sin, hidden or public. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us the courage and enable us to go out of this uh, uh, cycle of addiction and, and sinful behavior and find a way out by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the help of those genuine brothers and sisters in the community who, believe me, will definitely help you when you uh, reach them out. I mean, I mean, I mean, it was a pleasure. Uh, my brothers and sisters to spend some time with you. I was telling the brothers who are organizing that we need uh, the whole workshop to be conducted. It's a whole day workshop and we have, and the whole day is the short version of the workshop on how to raise awareness about porn addiction. So what we have discussed today really is an, uh, the tip of an iceberg. We didn't discuss much details, but I hope and I pray that this is the beginning for more to come, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, all the brothers and sisters behind the scene of Abu Huraira Center. Uh, it's an amazing initiative. You are among the few people who have taken that courageous step to talk about something uh, that's considered as taboo. Uh, so may Allah bless you for that and reward you. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.